I am Dr. Benin and welcome back to the fourth part of the presentation on fundamentals of tooth preparation. And in this part we are going to see about the primary resistance form in detail. As we all know that tooth preparation can be divided into two stages, the initial stage and the final stage. Primary resistance form is the second step in the initial stage of tooth preparation. Before going to the details of primary resistance form, let's see an example. I hope this example will help you all to understand what a primary resistance form actually is. There is a decayed tooth. We are doing two types of preparation. In the first preparation, there is a very big cavity prepared and it was restored with a restorative material. The restorative material is quite thick and it should be very strong because there is adequate bulk. In the second preparation, we made a ultra conservative small cavity preparation and we restored it with the same restorative material which is quite thin. What happened after some years is, in the first situation, the restoration was very strong but the tooth started cracking off because the tooth has become weak because we made a very big cavity preparation the tooth structure that was remaining has become very weak and it started fracturing off, thus ending up with a restorative failure. In the second situation, the restoration is very thin and so it is very weak. So the tooth was strong but the restoration started fracturing off, ended up with a restorative failure. So what actually a primary resistance form is, we should maintain the strength of the tooth at the same time we should provide an enough bulk for the restorative material so that the restoration will not fracture and also the tooth also can withstand fracture. So thus a primary resistance form is defined as the shape and placement of a preparation walls that best enable the remaining tooth structure and the restoration to withstand without fracture under masticatory forces delivered principally in the long axis of the tooth. We could study the primary resistance form under the following headings. First we will see the principles which are employed in the primary resistance form. The first and foremost principle is to use the box shape cavity preparation with a relatively flat floor. Whenever a masticatory load is delivered along the long axis of the tooth, the relatively flat floor and the box shaped cavity preparation will withstand the forces. If we are not providing a flat floor and a box shaped cavity, the tooth will have insufficient strength to withstand the forces which are acting along the long axis of the tooth. This can be better understood by looking into the following example. We are able to walk because the force is directed along our long axis from our body to the foot. So we are able to walk straight. In the second example, we could see it is impossible for us to walk over the walls because once we start walking on the walls, our forces from the body are directed in a direction which is not along our long axis. That force will not let us walk through the walls. This is the same reason whenever a masticatory force is directed along the long axis of the tooth, the tooth should be strong enough to withstand the masticatory load. The second principle that is essential to provide a primary resistance form is we should make the preparation as conservative as possible, thus protecting the cusp and the sound tooth structure, minimizing the extension so that the tooth will not fracture. The third principle that is employed is the rounding or coving of the internal line angles. There are two types of line angles, the internal and the external line angles. If we are rounding the internal line angles, that will prevent the fracture of the tooth by disrupting the stress concentration points. At the same time, if we are rounding the external line angles, 
it will prevent the fracture of the restoration. The internal line angles in a tooth preparation are rounded with the help of the burr at the time of tooth preparation. There is no extra measures should be taken in order to rounding the internal line angles. The external line angle, for example, the axiopalpal line angle should be rounded with the help of a gingival marginal trimmer. If we are not rounding the external line angle, the restoration will fracture. One of the most common reason for fracture of class 2 amalgam restoration is not rounding the axiopalpal line angle. The fourth principle employed for providing primary resistance form is to cap the weak cusp. We have seen about capping the cusp in adequate depth in the outline form and initial depth itself. Here also in order to maintain the strength of the tooth and to withstand the tooth from getting fractured, whenever it is indicated, we should cap the weak cusp. The cusp capping is not necessary if the dentist feels that the tooth has a very big cusp and it is really strong even though there is an extensive decay, still the cusp are really strong. In those situations, there is no need for capping the cusp. Root canal treated teeth are always weaker compared to that of a vital tooth. So whenever if we are doing a restoration in a root canal treated tooth, we may have to go for cusp capping more often than the vital tooth. The fifth principle is to provide adequate thickness of restorative material. If there is no adequate thickness, the material itself will become weak and it will fracture. For example, for most of the amalgam restoration, the minimum thickness should be 1.5 mm. For cast metal restoration, it should be 1 to 2 mm. For a porcelain, that is a ceramic restoration, the minimum thickness should be 2 mm. For a composite restoration, it varies. Still, in the stress bearing area, most often it should have at least a minimum thickness of 1 to 2 mm. As we have seen in the definition itself, the tooth should be strong, also the restoration should be strong. So this principle provides an adequate thickness of the restorative material so that the restoration will not get fractured. The sixth principle is to provide a relatively flat pulpal wall of uniform depth into the tooth. That is, if you are looking into the mesial side and the distal side, it should have an equal depth. For example, if the mesial depth of cavity preparation is 2.5 mm, distally also it should be of 2.5 mm. If we are not providing that, the forces will not be directed perpendicular to the long axis. That is, the floor will not be flat, so the forces acting along the long axis of the tooth cannot be taken by the flat pulpal floor. It will lead to the forces tilting or diverting to one of the wall more compared to the other leading to fracture of the tooth. The seventh principle that is employed in providing primary resistance form is whenever it is possible we should consider doing a bonding procedure. Let it be a composite let it be an amalgam or whatever the restoration that we are trying to do. Whenever we feel that a bonding could be performed, then we should consider it. For example, a composite restoration will not have a flat floor. It cannot have a box shaped cavity, but still the primary resistance form is provided by having a bonding. Whenever we find that we cannot provide adequate depth or the dimensions, for an amalgam restoration, in order to enhance the resistance form, we should consider bonding amalgam also. Now we will move on to the factors which influence the primary resistance form. The first and foremost important factor is the occlusal contact and the masticatory force. Whenever we find that the restoration or the decay is going to be covering a wide surface area 
in the tooth, the restoration is obviously going to be covering the wide area. Whenever the opposing tooth is going to make contact with a big restoration, then the forces are going to be more. And the masticatory force if you are considering, once we move from the midline of the jaw closer towards the condyle that is from anterior region towards the posterior region, the masticatory force or the load is going to be more. So whenever we are considering a restoration in a posterior teeth, we should choose a restorative material which have adequate strength to withstand this masticatory force. So we should choose a stronger restoration whenever the occlusal conduct going to be made is wide or large that is a larger restoration and if we are going to place the restoration in a posterior region. Bonding of amalgam, composite or ceramic restoration should be considered whenever it is possible. Bonding of the restoration will reinforce the weakened tooth structure. Now we will move on to the features which are employed in primary resistance form. As we have seen already, we should always provide a relatively horizontal floors along with a box shaped cavity preparation. The box shaped cavity preparation is very essential in order to prevent the wedging force from the restoration. A wedging effect is an consequence in which whenever a masticatory load is directed along the long axis of the tooth and if the restoration is not having a box shaped cavity for example if it is having a occlusally diverging cavity preparation then the forces which are directed along the long axis will be transferred to the walls of the restoration by the restoration. So whenever we are directing a force along the long axis the restoration will divert the force along the walls. So if some of the walls are weak already, that wall may get fractured. So this is called an wedging effect. The third feature is to include all the weakened tooth structure we have already seen. Whenever a cusp is weak, we should include it along with the cusp capping procedure. And whenever there is a weak tooth structure which is present between two cavity preparation, which goes less than 0.5 mm then it should be included along with the cavity preparation. We should always preserve the cuspal and the marginal ridge strength. The marginal ridge of a molar after cavity preparation should be at least 2 mm in width while in case of a premolar it should be at least 1.6 mm in width. The round and internal line angles will prevent the propagation of the force from the restoration towards the tooth that will prevent the accumulation of the stresses at some points. For an amalgam restoration, the internal line angle should be rounded. For an cast restoration, the internal line angle should be definite. That means it is not round, it is not sharp. It is definite. It is in between round and sharp. For a direct filling gold restoration, the internal line angle should be sharp. Direct filling gold is the only restoration where we prepare purposefully the line angles to be sharp. That is important because for a direct filling gold, in order to initiate the restorative procedure, we should need place direct filling gold material to be held inside the tooth. In order to provide that, we need a sharp internal line angle. Adequate thickness of restorative material is needed. It is one of the features that should be provided. And the reduction of the cusp. We have seen about the reduction of the cusp in detail while studying the outline form and the initial depth. Still, whenever we are planning to do a cusp capping, the cusp reduction should be done as early as possible in the tooth preparation. This is because we are going to do a tooth preparation which is as conservative and which have to be as convenient for us to do the preparation. If we are reducing the cusp that will provide more accessibility and the further areas of the tooth can be prepared more conservatively. So whenever a cusp capping or cusp reduction is indicated, it should be done as early as in the tooth preparation. If the dentist is in a doubt whether this needs a cusp capping or not, the tooth is not that much damaged. 
So in this situation, the operator, that is the dentist, may go for a bonded restoration. A bonded restoration, for example, a composite restoration is a bonded restoration which will reinforce the tooth and it may prevent the fracture of the cusp. So if the dentist decides not to go for a cusp capping procedure, then the restoration like amalgam should be preferably avoided. The dentist may choose a composite restoration over amalgam restoration in those situations. And the last feature that is, whenever we think of giving a bonded restoration, then it is better to keep the preparation walls roughened, which is not indicated for an amalgam or a cost restoration, but for a bonded restoration like composite, the roughened tooth walls will increase the surface area for bonding and thus it enhances the strength of the tooth which will enhance the primary resistance form of the tooth. So thus we have come to the conclusion of the primary resistance form. So primary resistance form emphasizes on two points that the tooth have to be strong and the restoration have to be strong. For the tooth to be strong, we have to provide a box shape of the cavity, a flat pulpal floor and a round and internal line angles. For the restoration to be strong, we have to provide adequate thickness of the restoration. Subscribe to my channel for more videos. Thank you for watching.